Okay. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We're going to give everybody a few minutes until uh, a few more minutes for everybody to log in. And we'll get started. Good morning, everyone. For those of you that are just now logging in, uh, thank you for joining us this morning. And we're going to get started here in about a minute or so. Okay, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm gonna, before we get started, I, I do have a disclaimer. Um, this webinar is not intended for press purposes. If you're part of the press, please disconnect. Um, and you can, you can reach out to us by calling us at our office. Um, and that way we can see if we can answer any questions you might have. Um, and at this time, I'm going to have our chairman of the board, Ms. Bianca Sandoval, uh, give us a welcome. Thank you, Julio. Good morning, everyone. Um, I am Bianca Sandoval, Senior Manager of Diversity Affairs for Austin Commercial, but also honored to serve as RHCA Chair. Um, on behalf of the RHCA Board of Directors, our staff, and our committees, working committees, we welcome each and every one of you for joining us today on this wonderful, hot, uh, Friday morning. Um, if you haven't been outside, it's pretty hot already. But um, we are going to be covering wonderful information covering the civil works infrastructure. Um, and I, I want to give a shout out to our, our committee, um, you know, Lois Frisbee and Alberto Mercado Flores, um, who they do a phenomenal job of, um, they started this out with uh, just kind of an idea and they have really expanded and taken this on and so I do thank you both for, for taking this under your wing and, um, and creating uh, 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 webinars and information that is uh, provided to all of our, our, our members. So I do thank you for that. Um, I hope everyone is safe. Uh, I know some of us are starting to go back into the office, um, but um, I hope you know, that again, the, the COVID-19, that everyone is staying safe and healthy um, and uh, again, on behalf of the RHCA, welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Bianca. And I'm going to bring up Alberto, who's a co-chair of, of our committee. Happy Friday, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. So helping you establish connections is not our only goal. By providing this webinar about civil works, funding, and disaster recovery, we hope that you will leave this webinar better informed on how to navigate the latest funding programs to help you maintain and improve your community. We appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you, Alberto. And just to let everybody know, I'm, I'm Julio Flores, um, staff person for the RHCA. Uh, this webinar was one of Alberto's idea. Uh, so we're seeing the, uh, uh, the outcome of this, which I think uh, we're gonna learn a lot um, you know, different types of work and a lot of information that's being provided today. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to launch a poll. Um, if everybody could please answer these questions, um, you're going to see a pop-up window come up. Our first question is, which service line fits you best? Are you an architect, civil engineering, general contractor, subcontractor, public agency, or other. Uh, question number two is, which agency do you have experience working with? Um, I'm going to give everybody a few minutes, about a minute or so, to, to answer these two questions. And I also want to remind everyone that if you have any questions, please ask them through the Q&A button. And we'll be able to, if time allows, we will uh, try to answer all the questions. Um, 
So I wanna make sure that you ask your questions through the Q&A portal. Okay, again, uh, the poll, when you answer the question, you, sh you should see a window that popped up. First question is, which service line fits you best? Best fits you? Architecture and civil engineering, general contractor slash subcontractor, public agency, other. Question number two, which agency do you have experience working with? The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, Texas General Land Office, Texas Water Development Board, or none of the above? So I'm gonna give everybody about 10 more seconds. So you should see the, the questions uh, popped up as a poll. Okay, so I am going to end the poll and share the results. Okay, as you can see the results, um, we have the majority of the attendees are in civil engineering. We do have some general and subcontractors. We have a few from the public agency and some that are in other. Uh, which agency do you have experience working with? Uh, the highest is the US Army Corps of Engineers. Next is Texas General Land Office, or 30% is Texas General Land Office. Texas Water Development Board and about 36% have not done any work with any of the agencies. So thank you everybody for taking that poll. Um, up next, I have Mr. Stanford Lynch. Um, we partnered with the North Texas Commission um, and Mr. Stanford Lynch will be able to give you guys more information on, on the North Texas Commission. Thank you, Julio. Um, the North Texas Commission is happy to happy to be partnering with uh, RL, RHCA this morning in this Civil Works Infrastructure Webinar. Uh, I'm Stanford Lynch, uh, co-chair of the recently created Water and Infrastructure Industry Council. Uh, my fellow co-chair is Brian O'Neill with uh, Pachico Co. The Water and Infrastructure Industry Council has been created by the North Texas Commission Board of Directors uh, to basically help our North Texas business community better understand the infrastructure needs that affect their businesses. Uh, the council is tasked with identifying, communicating, and educating the North Texas Commission members regarding infrastructure planning, funding, and implementation. Today's webinar is a perfect example of the types of issues that need to be addressed. For our guest presenters today, we want to be advocates for their respective agencies to assist them in carrying out their mission and goals. Uh, the council plans to develop a series of programs each year to help our business members understand the issues so that they can better and better advocate with our local, state, and federal partners. Uh, the council was, was planning to have our first water summit uh, this coming August, but uh, the COVID-19 uh, incident has uh, ha had to cancel that uh, water summit. We do plan uh, to develop a legislative issues paper in July to identify our most pressing infrastructure issues at the state and federal level. We're also working on other infrastructure issues important to our members. Uh, we are developing partnerships and initiatives looking at broadband accessibility and in the transportation infrastructure area, uh, P3s and smart cities. Uh, with that, uh, I want to again thank the RHCA and in particular Julio for allowing the North Texas Commission to be a part of this program. Um, I really look forward to the presentations and the discussions that follow. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Lynch. 
So up next, I have Mr. Lewis Frisbee, who is our committee co-chair. Uh, Lewis, um, you can come on and sure. thank our sponsors. Sure. Uh, good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, I'm Lewis Frisbee. I'm the CEO of Metropolitan Infrastructure, uh, one of the um, one of the um, sponsors of this organization. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the, the sponsors that you see there on your screen: Freeze and Nichols, Lockwood Andrews and Newnham, Wood Hayden Consultants. I don't know if Rachel is here with Hayden, good friend of mine. Uh, Anderson Asphalt Concrete Paving LLC. You see there our logo for Metropolitan Infrastructure and GEI Consulting Engineers and Scientists. So uh, thank you very much to all of our sponsors for uh, helping us to uh, put together this webinar and I hope all the attendees will get some important and useful information uh, from this presentation. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Lewis. And again, thank you to our sponsors. Um, if you guys want to take a screenshot of this, this is, uh, we listed out their social media sites. I think it's a good way also to get information from each one of these organizations. Uh, up next, I have Mr. Lars Zetterstorm, um, who will be introducing our first two speakers. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, currently retired Lars Edestrom. I currently am the Vice President for Federal Programs with Lockwood, Henders, and Newnham. It's my privilege to first introduce Major Roderick J. Foreman. He is the current Deputy Commander for the Fort Worth District of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. He assumed this position a little less than a year ago on the 17th of June of 2019. He originally was commissioned from the Reserve Officer Training Corps after graduating from the South Carolina State University in Orangeburg, South Carolina, with a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering. Additionally, he holds a Master of Arts in Procurement and Acquisition Management from Webster University. Prior to assuming the responsibility of Deputy Commander for the Fort Worth District, he's had a multitude of different leadership and staff positions throughout his 17-year Army career and throughout the world. Of note, he was the executive officer for the Deputy Commanding General for the United States Army Central Command. He also was the Brigade Executive Officer, Brigade Operations Officer, and Director of Public Works deployed to Qatar for an area support group. He's had several U.S. Army Corps of Engineers assignments, uh, one with the St. Louis District uh, in the Engineering Construction se Section of Program Management. He also has been in the USACE Operations Center as part of Joint Task Force Bravo uh, in Operations Cell in Honduras. He has been an advisor to the Iraqi Army, and he has been an Assistant Operations Officer in a Combat Engineer Battalion in Korea. He also has had numerous other leadership positions at the company level uh, during his career. His awards include a Bronze Star Medal and numerous other Army and Joint Awards during his long and successful career. It's my uh, privilege to introduce to all of you today, uh, Major Ma uh, Roderick Foreman. Thank you. Thank you, I appreciate the introduction, uh, it was great. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Major Foreman, as you just heard. I'm the Deputy Commander of the Fort Worth District. I am grateful for the opportunity to provide each of you an overview of the Fort Worth District and share some of our information this morning. Next slide, please. Next slide. This is our agenda. Uh, we'll talk about the district overview. Uh, we'll cover COVID-19 impacts, uh, regulatory, and we'll talk about some of our project opportunities. Next slide. This is the Fort Worth uh, leadership, starting at the top with Colonel Ken Reed, who's our district commander, uh, the deputy civilian, is Mr. Eric Buers, he's our DPM, and myself. And as you can see, there are a host of other people uh, from Mr. Brian Giacomozzi, who's our engineer construction, uh, Mr. Gerard Henry, who's our contractor division. And also we have Mr. Derek Terrell, who's our district chief office counsel. Next slide, please. 
This is the Fort Worth placement. Uh, we use this to tell our story and to talk about the district. Uh, as you can see, our mission is at, at the Fort Worth district is to provide vital public engineering services in peace and war, to strengthen our nation's security, energize the economy, and reduce risk from disasters. Now, I'll just hit a few points on this slide. Uh, military construction, we're in three states, New Mexico, Texas, and Louisiana. We're on 15 installations, and we have 764 projects. Uh, for our civil works, we have 51 projects. Uh, we have 33, or we supply 33% of the Texas water through our 25 lakes and reservoirs. And we have 373 miles of levee and bank protection. Uh, moving down to our international and interagency support. Uh, our goal here is to provide technical assistance to federal agencies, state and local governments, tribal nations, and private U.S. firms. Uh, some of our stakeholders are the Bureau of Engraving and Printing, the Department of Veteran Affairs, and our largest is the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. Next slide, please. This is the backside of our placement. Uh, as you can see uh, in the little dots that's numbered, that uh, depicts our 25 lakes and reservoirs. Uh, the color codes are our river basins. Uh, if you look closely, you'll see the black outlines, which are our civil works boundaries, and the green going out to, towards Louisiana are our military boundaries. Next slide, please. COVID-19, uh, so just to touch a, to give you an overview as you say it's proper. Uh, so under FEMA and Health and Human Services, our main mission during the COVID-19 response are conducting facility assessments, planning, engineering, design, contracting, and, consult and constructing alternate care facilities, which is called ACFs. Uh, the approach has been to take existing facilities such as hotels, college dorms, stadiums, and convention centers and turning them into those ACFs. In the state of Texas, out of the 61 facility assessments, there were no con contracts uh, for the Fort Worth District out of the 61 assessments. Next slide, please. Internally to the district, <clears throat> we have had minimal impact to our programs. Our budget levels are unchanged. Our $2 billion program continues to remain at the same level. Uh, we continue to follow the CDC and DOD safety guidelines. 75% of our personnel are still teleworking and we still conduct vital uh, virtual meetings daily. Our construction specialists, rangers, have worked at their duty stations doing the appropriate personal safety practices. And we continue to accommodate requests from our partners such as A&E contractors and meet virtually and offsite. Next slide. Next slide. Programs and opportunities. Uh, we have a number of programs and opportunities. Uh, any advertising announcements, announcements for the Fort Worth District are available at the two web links below. Uh, if you have any questions or concerns, you can reach out to Ms. Carolyn Staten who's the Deputy Office Small Business Programs for the Fort Worth District. Uh, and through the next couple of slides, you'll see all the different opportunities and programs. Next slide, please. And we'll just cycle through these slides just so you can see and just get a picture. And there'll be to your you'll be able to go through and, and check them out as, as you please. Yes, and just to let everybody know, we're, we'll cycle through these quickly, but we will send out an email with, uh, so that you're able to uh, look at these opportunities uh, with, more, you know, with more time and more detail. That's the last slide for this one. And so if you could go back up to the regulatory slide, that would be the slide that Mr. Mobley 
uh, speak softly. Okay, and at this time, Lars, if we could have you introduce Mr. Brandon, and I am apologize, I'm gonna go back through the slides. Uh, so, Absolutely. Mr. Lars, if you um, could introduce Brandon. Yep. Uh, good morning, Ian, ladies and gentlemen. This is Colonel Retired Lars Zetterstrom. Uh, it's my privilege to introduce uh, Mr. Brandon Mobley, who currently serves as the Chief of Regulatory Division for the Fort Worth District of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, Mr. Mobley began his career as a natural resource specialist with the Texas Parks and Wildlife Department in the Coastal Fisheries Division. He has been a Department Army civilian for more than 16 years, all of which have been with the Fort Worth District and all with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. He has rose through the ranks in multiple different divisions within the Fort Worth District, the Planning and Environmental and Regulatory Division as an Environmental Resource Specialist, He's also served in the operations division as both a national resource management specialist and the chief of natural resources and recreation. He has served as the chief of regulatory division since 2019, which is a significant responsibility due to the fact that the Fort Worth district has responsibility for 53% of the state of Texas. And together with the Galveston district, my former district, the Albuquerque and the Tulsa districts are responsible for the prudent development and environmental conservation of the great state of Texas through the Army Corps of Engineers Regulatory Authority. So he also has volunteered to serve in leadership roles on numerous uh, teams across the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. He's the chair of the Invasive Species Leadership Team, also serves on the Stewardess Advisory, the Master Planning Training Development, and the Shoreline Management Teams. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Brandon Mobley. Thank you, Mr. Zetterstrom. Uh, Again, my name is Brandon Mobley. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for the opportunity to uh, visit with y'all a little bit on some of the um, uh, items that we have going on in the regulatory world. Uh, I've got two bullets up here, um, nationwide permits and, and the WOTUS rules, navigable waters protection rule. Uh, uh, if you're familiar with those, you know they've garnered a lot of attention nationwide uh, in the last couple of years. And uh, <clears throat> in reference to a little bit of background on nationwide permits, um, once the uh, Water Pollution Control Act of 1972 was established, uh, also referred to as a Clean Water Act, uh, the EPA uh, gave the Corps of Engineers respons responsibility of regulating Section 404 of that act. And uh, you know we've been doing that ever since. During that time, as the program has progressed, uh, nationwide permits were developed that kind of uh, streamlined certain activities uh, that we regulate. And, and those have been of value to certain uh, uh, types of linear projects, recreation projects, and, and multiple types of construction projects uh, nationwide. <clears throat> uh, and typically, every five years, those uh, come out for renewal. And uh, we are, uh, in that process right now. Uh, I, I don't have a date on when the revised uh, nationwide permits will come out, but it, it is due this year. Um, lots of uh, visibility on challenges with some of the nationwide permits and uh, uh, that, that has presented some hurdles for us, but uh, we've, we continue to find uh, alternatives and, and figure out ways to continue with the mission um, so uh, right now we are uh, clicking on all cylinders uh, in execution. Within the, uh, within the navigable waters protection rule, waters of the U.S., um, with the current administration, uh, they have, have rewritten some of the rules that we currently have in place, and those have been, have been uh, put into the Federal Registrar. And then, and those will be implemented for us June twenty second. What that means for us uh, compared to the current rules is uh, the the main thing is we'll lose uh, jurisdiction over ephemeral streams and waterways. And typically, uh, you, you know, those are uh, those types of uh, waterways where they're typically dry uh, and they'll and they'll flow after a rain event. So uh, based off of the other um, 
all the other mechanisms that that one's primarily going to be one most affected for us. Uh, we, uh, for our district and our western portion of the state of Texas coverage, that would probably be, be more accented a little bit more than as you as you move further west. Um, also anticipate legal challenges to that as well. Uh, and so further guidance will be coming along on that as well. But as of right now, we'll be implementing this uh, June 22nd. Um, and uh, that's that's all I got, uh, Julio. Okay, thank you. So at this time, what we're gonna do is uh, take some questions. If you can please ask your ask questions, questions through the Q&A portal. Um, and then we can, we can get these answered. Okay. So we'll give everybody a, a, a minute or two, but yes, we will be sharing the presentation uh, via email here in the next few days. So again, if you can ask your questions through the Q and A portal. Okay, so I have a question here. I would like to learn more about the Dallas floodway procurements. Major Foreman or Brandon. Yeah, we can send some information on 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 that. Yeah, just provide your email address and we'll make sure to get you that information. Okay, and then I have another question. Is the uh, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers concluded all facility condition assessments related to COVID-19? Brandon, or Major Corbin. That mission assignment is currently over. You said it's currently open? Over. Oh, it's Complete. over? Okay. Complete. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Major Foreman and Brandon for providing the information. Um, up next, I have Ms. Kimberly, Ms. Kimberly High, who is one of our sponsors. Um, she's the Texas office manager for Wood PLC. Kimberly, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and introduce our next speaker, Colin. Sure. Um, hi, as, as you mentioned, I'm Kimberly High, the Texas office manager for Wood. Uh, Wood, for those of whom are not familiar with Wood, we're a global uh, 80 firm that provides project delivery, engineering, and technical services in a variety of markets. Uh, those markets include uh, environment and infrastructure, clean energy, power and process, oil and gas, uh, mining and general industrial sector. We serve a variety of clients, uh, government as well as private sector. And we really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this webinar and to introduce the next speaker, uh, Colin Nichols. Colin is a management analyst with the Texas General Land Office Community Development and Revitalization Division. He has a Master of Arts degree in International Economics and Political Economy from the School of Advanced International Studies at John Hopkins. He also has a Bachelor of Arts degree in history from the University of North Texas. Colin co-authored Hurricane Harvey, Texas at Risk, which is the GLO's comprehensive after action report on Hurricane Harvey. This report includes policy recommendations aimed at disaster response and recovery reform. Colin is currently managing special projects related to the GLO's CDBG programs for disaster recovery and mitigation. And with that, I will hand it over to Colin. Hi there. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. So as Kimberly mentioned, uh, I'm a management analyst with the Texas General Land Office, and uh, I primarily uh, manage special projects relating to community development block grants for disaster recovery and mitigation. You can go ahead and hit the uh, next slide, please. Right, so uh, during the course of the presentation, I'll uh, just give a brief introduction and history to uh, CDBG DR and MIT uh, grants. Um, I'm also gonna go over the, uh, the Texas CDBG MIT action plan and competition, and uh, also provide some information on additional programs under the uh, CDBG MIT action plan. And uh, last uh, time permitting, we'll go into a little bit of a Q&A session. So next slide. 
So since 2011, the Texas General Land Office has administered uh, community development block grants for disaster recovery, and more recently for uh, community development block grants for mitigation, uh, which I'll refer to as CDBG-DR and CDBG-MIT, or DR and MIT for short. These grants sometimes follow a presidential disaster declaration, though only about 15% of disasters receiving such a declaration also receive these uh, supplemental grants. Uh, the Community Development and Revitalization Division of the GLO, often abbreviated CDR, is a division tasked with overseeing these DR and MIT-funded activities, including economic development, infrastructure, housing, and planning. Next slide. So in this slide, uh, we have a uh, small little breakdown um, covering the uh, general summary of DR and MIT grants implemented by the GLO since 2011, which totals around $14 billion. Um, most of that's been in DR to recover from hurricanes Rita, Dolly, Ike, and Harvey, the 2011 wildfires, and then flood and storm events in 2015 and 16. Um, more recently, uh, we are now administering CDBG mitigation funds for storms uh, from 2015 and 16, as well as Hurricane Harvey. And uh, we have an upcoming CDBG DR grant for disasters in 2018 and 2019, such as uh, Tropical Storm Imelda and the floods in the valley. So that will be coming pretty soon. Um, next slide, please. So just to give a, a brief description of DR and, uh, yeah, uh, DR and MIT grants, CDBG DR grants are uh, relatively flexible. Uh, they are associated with presidentially declared disasters, meaning they have a tieback requirement to that disaster and they are subject to requirements in the Stafford Act. While CDBG MIT is a unprecedented uh, type of grant funding, it's never been issued before by the Housing and Urban Development Department, um, and it does not require a tieback um, because it's mitigation oriented. So basically this means that instead of uh, tying back to a previous disaster, it can be forward looking to mitigate against future disasters. Um, and the CDBG MIT, though it was only allocated back in August of 2019, it's actually been in the works with uh, both Congress and the Housing and Urban Development Department uh, back since uh, April 2018 with the publishing of a uh, grantee memo and a Federal Register notice. Next slide, please. So some of you might be familiar with the, uh, the regular uh, CDBG program as it's been a very important source of funding for states and local jurisdictions since the 1970s. However, I think it's really important to distinguish the regular CDBG program from the DR and MIT programs. So the regular CDBG funds are distributed on an annual and recurring basis to what are known as entitlement and non-entitlement communities. Entitlement communities generally administer their own CDBG allocations at the local level, while the Texas Department of Agriculture uh, administers these funds to the non-entitlement communities in Texas. Uh, DR and MIT funds, on the other hand, are appropriated by Congress as an emergency supplemental appropriation following a major disaster, meaning it is not recurring on an annual basis per se, and the eligil eligibility for funding varies each allocation. Moreover, uh, DR and MIT funding isn't always disaster specific, where a CDBG is not. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, um, CDBG mitigation is a first of its kind grant from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development and is geared specifically towards disaster mitigation activities. Uh, per a HUD Federal Register notice published on August 30th, 2019, the state of Texas was allocated nearly $4.3 billion in CDBG MIT funding. This funding covers 140 counties across the state that were affected by disasters in 2015, 2016, and Hurricane Harvey. The state action plan outlining the use of these funds was approved by HUD on March 31st, 2020. Next slide. So the HUD guidelines require that at least 50% of CDBG MIT funds address disaster mitigation needs in what are called most impacted and distressed areas or mid areas. HUD mid areas are designated after conducting data assessments from FEMA individual assistance and SBA programs using certain thresholds to determine if the community is most impacted based on damage and other multipliers. Additionally, any county that receives a presidential disaster declaration is eligible for CDGB, CDBG DR funding, even if it is not designated as a HUD mid area. Uh, typically, guidance suggests that the state can generally designate a presidentially dis uh, declared disaster counties as state mid counties if it so chooses. Next slide. Now this slide is particularly important because uh, it essentially defines which activities will be eligible for the use of CDBG MIT funding and it's HUD's definition of mitigation. Uh, to quote the Federal Register, it is uh, mitigation uh, describes those activities that increase resilience to disasters 
and reduce or eliminate the long-term risk of loss of life, injury, damage to, and loss of property, and suffering and hardship by lessening the impact of future disasters. Next slide. So of the uh, nearly $4.3 billion in MIT funding allocated to the state of Texas, more than $4 billion um, is set aside for communities impacted by Hurricane Harvey, more than $169 million for those impacted by disasters in 2016, and more than $52 million dedicated for those impacted by those in 2015. Communities which were impacted by more than one of those disasters uh, will be eligible for all applicable pots of funding. So basically what that means is Harris County, since they received a disaster declaration in 2015, 2016, and for Hurricane Harvey, they're eligible for each pot of funding. Whereas uh, Denton County in the DFW area only received a declaration for 2015 and is only eligible for the 2015 pot of MIT funding. It's also worth noting that the city of Houston and city of San Marcos each received a separate allocation of CDBG MIT funding, which those jurisdictions will administer at the local level. Next slide. So I will discuss MIT funding in more detail uh, during the remainder of the presentation, but this information can also be found in the state of Texas uh, action plan for CDBG MIT, which is housed on our disaster recovery website, which is recovery.texas.gov. Simply go to the website and click on the links circled in red. Next slide. And from the mitigation funding page, you can access that action plan by clicking on the link circled in red. There's also a brief six page summary available at one of the links further down the list. And I promise that's also a good read because one of them is over 400 pages and this one's six. It's very nice. Next slide, please. So this slide, I know it's a little bit hard to see um, with the small font, but it does cover a lot of information. It shows the total um, allocation budget for CDBG MIT as outlined in the action plan. And if you can't see everything perfectly clearly right now, don't worry. Um, I, I think RHCA is going to distribute the presentation after the webinar, so you'll be able to reference all this stuff. Next slide. And this slide here uh, includes a breakdown of MIT programs, which will be administered, detailing the amount of funding to be spent on each program. Um, you may notice the majority of MIT funding is dedicated to the um, 2015, 2016, and Hurricane Harvey state mitigation competitions, totaling more than $23 billion and making up approximately 40, sorry, 54% of the MIT allocation. Next slide. Another very difficult slide to see is this uh, Gantt chart, which uh, it shows the anticipated program timelines for uh, the MIT program listed on the previous slide. And uh, like I said, it is hard to see, uh, but this will be available in the presentation after the webinar. So you can reference this at a later date. Next slide. So more than $46 million was allocated for the 2015 uh, mitigation competition and it's open to units of local government, Indian tribes and COGS within 2015 flood eligible areas. The city of Houston and the city of San Marcos are not eligible for this competition because they received that direct allocation from HUD. Award amounts can range from 3 million to 10 million and examples of projects include flood control and drainage improvements, infrastructure improvements, green infrastructure, public facilities, and buyouts and acquisitions. And these uh, examples of projects apply to all the competitions, so I don't have to repeat myself the next few slides. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a map of all the counties which are eligible for uh, 2015 uh, state uh, mitigation competition funding. Uh, it includes 116 declared counties and four HUD mid counties, Travis County, Hayes County, Hidalgo County, and Harris County. Uh, next slide, please. So more than 147 million was allocated for the uh, 20, 2016 floods state mitigation competition. And this competition is structured very similarly to the 2015 competition with uh, similar award amounts, similar eligible entities and uh, similar uh, project types that are eligible. Next slide, please. So this is a map for the uh, counties which are eligible for the 2016 competition. It includes 71 declared counties and five HUD mid counties, uh, Brazoria, Fort Bend, Harris, Montgomery, and Newton counties. Next slide. And this is the big one. More than $2.1 billion is dedicated to the Hurricane Harvey State Mitigation Competition, making this competition the largest use of MIT funding in the state of Texas Action Plan. Consequently, this competition is structured slightly differently than 2015 and 2016 competitions. The maximum award amount is 100 million, up from 10 million in the other competitions. Additionally, the list of eligible entities for this competition is expanded to include state agencies, special purpose districts, and Port and River authorities. 
Lastly, this competition will be, uh, will have two rounds of project awards as opposed to one round for the 2015 and 2016 competitions. And next slide, please. So here's a map of the eligible counties for Hurricane Harvey. Um, there are 49 declared counties, uh, 20 of which are HUD mid areas, and there are also 10 uh, HUD mid zip codes. Next slide, please. More information on the uh, competitions, uh, including uh, uh, project criteria, the application portal, and application guides. Uh, pro data on the programs and other forms can be found at recovery.texas.gov slash mitigation. Next slide. Uh, since this is a competition, uh, projects will be scored on a 100-point criteria basis. So awards um, for the 2015 and 2016 competitions will be for the, uh, the eight boxes in the center of the slide. The Hurricane Harvey competition will also include one small five-point criteria for mitigation resiliency measures. Um, it's just the main thing to note here is that applications must score at least 65 points to qualify, although this does not guarantee an approval for funding. Next slide, please. Another large program as part of the uh, MIT allocation um, is the Regional Mitigation Program. So each council of government impacted by Hurricane Harvey will be allocated funds as part of the Regional Mitigation Program or COGMI. Each COG will develop a method of distribution to allocate funds to units of local government and Indian tribes. The GLO encourages the prioritization of regional investments with regional impacts in risk reduction to develop disaster resilient infrastructure, including upgrading of water, sewer, solid waste, communications, energy, transportation, health and medical infrastructure, and natural mitigation infrastructure. Uh, this program will split the funding on an 80-20 basis between HUD, mid, and state mid areas, respectively. Eligible activities include infrastructure for hazard mitigation and buyouts and acquisitions. Next slide. And here is a breakdown of the, uh, the COGS and the funding for each COG based on HUD, mid, and state mid areas. And again, this will be available in the presentation as it's uh, distributed following the webinar. Next slide, please. So the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program Supplemental is a program that was developed in conjunction with the Texas Division of Emergency Management, or TDEM. And basically, uh, we have called for the, um, the selection, prioritization, and a variety of local mitigation projects through FEMA's Hazard Mitigation Program. The supplemental fund basically helps HMGP um, MIT eligible projects that were selected during Hurricane Harvey but were unable to receive funding. Um, this program was allocated $170 million in the action plan and there is a 50-50 HUD state MIT split with um, eligible applicants being the 2015 Hurricane Harvey DR eligible counties with previous Hurricane Harvey FEMA HMGP submitted projects. I know that's a mouthful. I apologize. Next slide, please. And these are the eligible activities um, selected by TDEM. Uh, and they include acquisition, demolition, elevation of flood prone structures, community and individual safe room programs, retrofitting facilities, um, small scale structural hazard control and protection projects, emergency generators, and post disaster code enforcement. Next slide. So the Coastal Resiliency Program, uh, which was allocated $100 million, is designed to fund projects identified in the Texas Coastal Resiliency Master Plan, which was developed by the Coastal Resources Division of the GLO. The plan was developed by a group of professionals and community representatives to identify potential coastal mitigation projects, um, including green infrastructure, gray infrastructure, and non-structural measures. The plan includes a tiered list of these coastal projects, which have not yet been funded. Uh, like I said, the program's been allocated $100 million with a 50-50 HUD state mid split. The maximum award amount is $60 million. The eligible applicants include units of local government, state agencies, NGOs, navigation districts, and port authorities. Next slide, please. The Hazard Mitigation Plans Program provides funds for the development of FEMA-approved local hazard mitigation action plans and an enhanced state hazard mitigation plan. Development or uh, updating of local hazard mitigation action plans may include studies to enhance a community's understanding of risk, including dam inundation studies, flood studies, and wildfire studies. The program was allocated $30 million in MIT funding, and uh, the award amount is $100,000 per plan to try to spread it out evenly amongst the communities as possible. 
Eligible entities include TDEM and uh, FEMA HMGP eligible uh, entities located within any Mid County. Next slide. The Resilient Communities Program provides funds for the development, adoption, and implementation of modern and resilient building codes, flood damage prevention ordinances, and local plans. Another main intent of the program is to bring together resilient local planning strategies and emergency management hazard mitigation plans. Uh, the program was allocated $100 million with an award amount of a maximum of $300,000 per entity. Eligible entities include units of local government uh, and Indian tribes located in any eligible area. Next slide. And finally, uh, regional and state planning was, uh, was uh, allocated to nearly $215 million um, in MIT funding. And uh, this funding will provide for a regional and statewide planning studies program and tools that will work to reduce risks and impacts of future disasters. The GLO will oversee these funds in partnership with local, state, and federal entities. Um, the GLO CDR planning team is currently soliciting feedback um, for which uh, planning studies will be carried out as part of the MIT program. The survey to provide feedback to the GLO is open until June 30th and can be found on a link included in the slide. And when we distribute out via PowerPoints, uh, the link will be included. Next slide. That concludes the, uh, the program overview. So now just some uh, major announcements that we need to make before we wrap up. So um, coming up on the planning side of things, we have uh, four planning studies. The Texas Disaster Information System, which attempts to synchronize disaster data in the state of Texas and uh, yield better results for both planning and uh, disaster response and disaster recovery as well as three regional flood studies, which study three major watersheds at, at the watershed level because uh, flooding and disasters do not pay attention to political boundaries. Uh, next slide. One major announcement that we uh, need to make is that the state mitigation competitions for 2015, 2016, and Hurricane Harvey are open as of May 28th, 2020, and will remain open until October 28th, 2020. This applies to the 2015 and 2016 competitions in their entirety and the first rounds of two of the Hurricane Harvey competition. The regional mitigation program for the COGS, as well as other programs, as well as technical assistance and workshops will be launched at various times in the future. And I highly recommend you all uh, look at the Gantt chart included in the presentation uh, for an excellent reference on the anticipated timing of future program launches. And next slide, please. So this concludes the GLO's presentation. Again, my name is Colin Nichols and I'm a management analyst with the GLO. My personal email is included on the slide just below my name. Um, if you have general questions about the mitigation programs, we highly encourage you to send those questions to CDR at recovery.texas.gov. Um, more specifically, if you have uh, questions about just the competitions itself, we have a dedicated email address for questions there as well. And that is cdr.mitigation at recovery.texas.gov. All other information can be found at recovery.texas.gov, our disaster recovery website. Thank you all so much. Okay, thank you, Colin. So at this time, if uh, anybody has any questions, please ask them through the Q&A. Uh, you just need to click on the Q&A button uh, and we'll take, we'll leave a, give a few minutes to, to ask any and answer any questions. Um, I have a question. Can you comment on the timeline of the regional flood studies? So I cannot comment on that uh, myself. Uh, the, our planning team, which is uh, housed within our division, might be able to provide a better answer. I highly recommend you reach out to myself or reach out via CDR at recovery.texas.gov so we can give you the best possible answer. Okay. Next question is, can you explain the state administration category for $214 million? I cannot off the top of my head. I, again, that's another question for the planning. They'll be able to explain in more detail. And I'd be happy to uh, make the introductions for you to get the best possible answer. Okay, next one. Uh, can you comment on how TDIS will work with INFRM? Right, so um, the Texas Disaster Information System, I, I'm definitely uh, not an expert planner or a uh, engineer. Um, I do know that INFIRM will be um, worked into the Disaster Information System because it is a major, major source of flooding and other disaster information. 
I don't know specifically how it's going to be plugged in, but I know that Infirm is being considered as one of the sources of data. Okay, thank you. And I have another one. Can you, sorry, wrong button. I would like to know more about program project management, professional services opportunities. So th those questions, I highly recommend, again, you send a uh, question to cdrrecovery.texas.gov to answer questions about uh, professional services. Okay, and, and you know, I have another question. I'm interested in project program management opportunities. Can you expand on that? Right, that, that, was, was that not the same question as last time? Okay. I, that, that was a similar answer. Okay. Um, and then if I have Major Foreman and Brandon, I do have a question for you. Um, if you, is there any update on NW12 and 2 and any update on the executive order by POTUS two weeks ago? If Brandon or Major Foreman Could you repeat the question? The question is, any update on NW12 and two, and then any update on the executive order by POTUS two weeks ago? Yeah, this is Brandon. I can answer that. I, I, I typed it into the uh, chat, but uh, my, my, may not have went through. Uh, in reference to Nationwide Permit 12, I don't have any updates on that. And I put my email address on there uh, if you want to reach out to me. Um, you know, given the legal implications, uh, we're not at liberty right now to discuss anything in reference to DOJ uh, involvement. Uh, the other question, what was the other question now? Uh, the other question was... Any update on executive order by POTUS two weeks ago? Uh, no. So we, we recently uh, got a copy of that. Uh, I noticed it doesn't have a number assigned to it yet, but um, we're already uh, digesting it and working uh, with headquarters on implementation. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So I have no other questions. Uh, up next, um, I'm going to bring up Adam Connor. Um, we had scheduled Ms. Uh, Brooke Pop, uh, who's the board member for the Texas Water Development Board, but uh, she's not able to join us today. Uh, but if, if Adam can unmute yourself and introduce yourself, let us know what you do and introduce our next speaker, please. Certainly. Thank you, Julio. Uh, I'm really impressed by how quickly Colin can pronounce CDBG. That was that was amazing. He should become an auctioneer or something. Yeah. Uh, but good afternoon. My name is Adam Connor. Uh, I'm a project manager at Friesen Nichols. Uh, Friesen Nichols, if you're not aware of us, we're a regionally based firm with national expertise. Uh, we're primarily in engineering, um, civil and uh, transportation, although we have folks like myself who do planning, uh, either transportation, water, urban planners. And just a, another thing of note is that we have a a dedicated funding specialist whose really full-time job is to find funding for folks like y'all. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out to me. Um, but without further ado, the more impressive resume is that of uh, Brooke Pop. And Brooke Pop was appointed uh, by the Texas Water Development Board um, by Governor Greg, Greg Abbott in 2018, and she's currently serving her second term on the board. Uh, prior to her appo appointment to the board, Ms. Pop served as the Director of Legislative Affairs for the Texas Comptroller of Public Accounts. While there, she led a team of legislative professionals to address statutory tax reforms. Before the Comptroller's office, Brooke served for the Office of Attorney General, where she worked on legislative issues, special litigation, and public finance, notably the legislation which created the SWIFT, State Water Impl Implementation Fund for Texas, and the State Water Implant Im Implementation Revenue Fund for Texas. Ms. Pop has 14 years of state government exper experience. She is a member of the State Bar of Texas and the Symphony League. 
Uh, Ms. Pop earned a Bachelor of Arts from Texas A&M University and a Juris Doctor from Texas Tech School of Law. Uh, finally, she lives in Austin with her husband, Spivey, and their, their two children, Henry and Heidi. And unfortunately, Brooke um, had a minor emergency in the family. Everyone's doing okay. Uh, so we have the next best thing, which is her chief of staff, uh, Patrick Lopez. And Patrick, so I'll, I'll pass it on to you. Patrick, if you can unmute yourself. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, good afternoon. When I started this, this is uh, Patrick Lopez, Texas Water Development Board. Um, sorry you guys don't get uh, the real thing today, but I, I hope to, to you know, be the next best thing or at least something close to that. Um, so the Texas Water Development Board is, uh, it's an infrastructure bank first and foremost, but it's a bank that also does uh, science, water science initiatives, and then uh, state water planning. So completely unlike um, any other bank uh, I've ever heard of. And the, the vast majority of um, the loans that we make to uh, cities, counties, water utilities, various types of water districts are uh, low interest loans, uh, well, well below what um, an entity would normally qualify if they sought funding on the open market. Um, so that's a little bit of background on the agency itself. As far as the board goes, uh, the water code specifies that uh, so there's, there's three board members. Um, one must have experience in finance. That's our chairman, Peter Lake. Another one must have experience in engineering. That's uh, Kathleen Jackson. She, she makes it uh, out and about uh, the state pretty often. So some of y'all might have seen her speak before. And then uh, the last of the three board members needs to be an attorney. So that's uh, my boss, Brooke Pop. Um, so if you can move on to the next slide, please, Julio. All right, so the mission of the Water Development Board um, is to provide leadership, information, education, and support for uh, planning, uh, finance, and outreach, with uh, finance being you know, probably the most important one. I believe our, our total loan portfolio now is uh, right at like $9 billion. So it's a, it's a significant amount of money that uh, the board has, has loaned out over its uh, 60 plus year history. And then you know, as we continue to service uh, the loans that are still active right now. Um, next slide, please. So this is a, this is kind of a busy infographic that you that you see here, but it does capture well kind of our three main uh, function areas. Uh, first one is the science up there in the the top left. So basically, we're talking about you know how much water do we have in our state's reservoirs and aquifers. Um, we we help uh, make that data available, uh, easily seen on our website in conjunction with our local partners. So how much water do we have? Uh, where is that water, uh, you know, located about the state? And uh, what's the quality of that water? Um, as far as the, the planning component goes, um, the agency was created in the 1950s in direct response to uh, the drought of record. Um, not sure if anyone uh, in the audience was, uh, was around then, but uh, that's the, uh, the standard to which all of the uh, regional planning groups are, are planning for. They're, they're planning uh, to guard against a drought of that level in the 1950s. That is the worst one that the state has experienced so far. For the first uh, four decades of the board's existence, it was a top-down planning process, uh, whereby essentially the state and the, the agency would dictate to uh, locals what projects they would build. Um, in 1997, there was some landmark uh, legislation that basically turned that process upside down. And then we switched to a bottom up planning process that we've been using pretty successfully for the last 20 plus years where their state is divided up into 16 regional water planning groups. Uh, and then those groups decide amongst themselves which projects uh, are most important to include in their regional plans. And then those 16 regional plans get rolled up into one big uh, state water plan that we publish every five years. Um, and one of the most important things about that state water plan, beyond just serving as, you know, a really helpful guide with lots of uh, key data and information, is that uh, any, any water supply project included in the state water plan 
is then uh, becomes eligible for uh, the SWIFT, uh, the State Water Implementation Fund for Texas that Adam had mentioned in Brooks' bio, um, which is kind of our you know gold standard um, water finance uh, plan with you know extremely attractive interest rates. Um, and then finally, that last piece is you know is that we we finance uh, water infrastructure projects uh, across the state. Um, so next slide, please. Um, Julio and Alberto had asked to uh, uh, include a little bit of info regarding the impact that COVID-19 has had on the agency. It's been largely business as usual, um, you know, as far as the function of the agency, but um, we have um, had pretty much everyone working from home for about three months now. Um, we did uh, conduct our first ever, ever virtual bond sale so the, the way it works, the way that we provide this money to local utilities is that uh, we go out on the open market um, utilizing the AAA credit rating of the state to, uh, to sell bonds. So we were able to do that uh, three weeks ago without having to send anyone to uh, New York, which is kind of the, the usual practice. So uh, the lesson learned was that you can borrow uh, you can borrow hundreds of millions of dollars without having to, to show up in person. So um, it's, it's a tremendous testament to uh, a, a lot of the staff we have on board. It's really top notch human capital at TWDB. Um, unfortunately though, uh, y'all might be aware that the governor, Lieutenant Governor and Speaker of the House asked every state agency to reduce their budgets by uh, 5%. So that's the current budget biennium um, and so it, you know, it says 5%, but here we are, you know, eight, nine months into the current fiscal year. So that's, you know, we've already been operating for almost half of that uh, fiscal biennium. So it's, it, it, in reality, it's more like a, you know, eight or 9% uh, cut for the remaining 15 months of the biennium. And then we don't know what the legislature is going to do when they reconvene in January, but um, you know, we're, we're certainly aware of the potential for uh, additional budget cuts um, that, that would come into effect in FY22 and FY23. Um, thankfully, our agency um, uh, has a mix of revenue sources. Um, so we, we, we do receive some federal funding, um, some general revenue funding, and then also uh, we're funded through other uh, dedicated funds. So um, since uh, the GR, the general revenue, is a, uh, a smaller component of, of our budget, um, I think that we're a little bit better positioned than other state agencies to weather uh, these cuts. Hopefully they won't affect us as much as they are some others, but um, you know, it, it remains to be seen what the financial fallout is gonna be from COVID. Um, next slide, please. All right, so um, you know, like our our uh, previous presenters from the military, we take uh, our marching orders and we respect the chain of command. So that means that um, the legislature is, uh, is the folks who, who gives us, um, who kind of defines our mission for us. So there were two big uh, flood mitigation bills that passed during the 2019 legislative session. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the first one is Senate Bill 7. The authors there were Senator Creighton and Representative Phelan, both out of Southeast Texas, that provided the money. And then Senate Bill 8, uh, authored by Senator Perry uh, out of Lubbock and Representative Larson out of San Antonio, uh, describes the uh, statewide flood mitigation planning that we're going to be doing. Um, Senate Bill 7 provided uh, funding for um, the Flood Infrastructure Fund, which is administered by our agency. And it also created and provided some funding for the Texas Infrastructure Resiliency Fund, which is administered by the Texas Department of Emergency Management. Um, and it should also be noted that there was uh, a uh, constitutional amendment on last November's uh, ballot that uh, voters had to approve uh, the creation of the flood infrastructure fund and it passed by uh, a pretty overwhelming uh, margin. I believe it was proposition eight on your ballot if, if you remember it from uh, November. And then uh, as far as Senate Bill 8 goes, the planning, um, basically we need to update uh, 
our floodplain mapping across the state, um, you know, with uh, development uh, being constant, right? You know, this is the, the fast, one of the fastest growing states in the country. Um, the, the floodplain is constantly changing as a result of that development. So that's, that's part of what's going on in Senate Bill 8. Um, and then I think I mentioned earlier, there's similar to our, our regional water planning for water supply. We're using a similar blueprint or template for uh, uh, coordinated regional planning. So the state is divided up into a number of regions, um, which I'll get into a little bit more. And then obviously there's a, uh, a state flood plan, which is a collection of the uh, 15 regional plans. Next slide, please. All right, uh, Senate Bill 7, the stated goal was to uh, encourage uh, development of structural and non-structural flood mitigation. Uh, I would imagine, you know, you guys are the builders. Uh, those of you in the audience, you're probably pretty familiar with, uh, you know, the structural components here. We're talking dams, levees, retention basins, flood walls. Um, the non-structural stuff is maybe a little bit less obvious, but it's it can also be uh, an important you know, a super essential uh, component of uh, flood mitigation. So that could mean anything from like uh, a buyout of a home or a business in a flood prone, flood prone area. It could be the construction of new wetlands or the rest, restoration of old wetlands. It could be a flood early warning system. Um, it could be a change in land use regulations or, uh, you know, education and outreach initiatives could also be con considered uh, non-structural flood mitigation. Um, and uh, Senate Bill 7 did, uh, you know, ask, task the board with um, uh, accounting for financial need when we decide how, how we're gonna provide uh, financial assistance to communities. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so uh, Senate Bill 7 was uh, funded, it was truly funded by uh, Senate Bill 500, and that's the supplemental appropriation bill. It's not that important, but, you know, if you're, if you're someone who follows the legislature, um, you know, maybe that's an interesting tidbit for you. So a total of $1.43 billion um, came from the ESF. That's the Economic Stabilization Fund, better known by most folks as the Rainy Day Fund. Um, so you can see the amount that came to our agency, $793 million for the FIF and then uh, 600 something million uh, to the Department of Emergency Management to fund the TIRF. Um, and so it, again, for those of you who follow the legislature or you know, just politics in general, um, you know, it's a pretty conservative legislature that uh, does not typically tap the rainy day fund. Um, so you know, this, is, um, this is notable. Um, and it, I mean, it shouldn't come as a coincidence, right? Because, you know, Hurricane Harvey was the uh, rainiest day in the history of Texas. So um, it, it was warranted to, to tap the rainy day fund um, to, to mitigate flood in the future. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> All right, so the flood infrastructure fund had a, a few other additional requirements laid out in Senate Bill 7. Um, political subdivisions um, have to act cooperatively um, this, uh, we can sum up this slide uh, basically in four words, and that's don't flood your neighbor. Um, as y'all are well aware, you know, what, uh, how you mitigate flood upstream can affect what happens downstream and vice versa. So it's essential that, um, you know, that we're not doing flood mitigation planning within our own, uh, you know, artificially created political boundaries because uh, floodwaters don't, they don't care <laughs> about that, right? They're, they're, they're gonna go where they're gonna go. Um, so it's, it's, it's key. That was a, a, a big principle that they were talking about, you know, all legislative session was that folks are working together so as to not uh, flood their neighbor. Um, next slide, please. Okay, uh, moving on to Senate Bill 8, uh, statewide planning for flood mitigation. Next slide, please. All right, so uh, this is from the text of the bill that the Water Development Board shall prepare and adopt a comprehensive state flood plan composed of uh, regional plans. Uh, it'll be a guide to state and local flood control policy. 
And uh, this last bullet point is, um, I'd say kind of more of an aspirational deal um, that it contribute to water supply where possible. Um, you know, I think, I think we're all familiar with the fact that flood water is pretty dirty and, uh, you know, uh, treating it to a level where it could be um, used for water supply purposes is, is a little bit of a, of a stretch, perhaps, you know, these are, these are my words, but, uh, you know, it's, it, it is definitely an important goal. Um, we've got, you know, Texas is known for, for being innovative. So um, this is kind of a eyes on the prize um, type of deal here with, uh, you know, converting, capturing flood water and uh, using it for water supply purposes. Um, next slide, please. All right, so uh, Senate Bill 8, it's gonna be a uh, collaborative um, process. Um, we adopted, uh, well, it already has been a collaborative process. So um, starting last summer, we adopted, uh, we met with six of our sister agencies. So that's TCEQ, Department of Ag, uh, General Land Office, Parks and Wildlife, uh, and then the uh, State Soil and Water Conservation Board to um, put together some guidance principles <clears throat> that our regional uh, regional flood planning groups can use as kind of a, a, a blueprint. Um, and then we conducted a listening tour, went around 14 cities last summer and did uh, two uh, virtual webinars for folks who couldn't make it to one. Um, so now we're in the process of designating uh, planning regions. We, we have a map. And then right now we're uh, doing the nomination process for 180 members. So that's uh, 12 members for each of 15 regional flood planning groups. Um, I'll touch a little bit more on, on what that looks like right now. Um, and then, you know, we're not, we're not leaving these uh, regional flood planning groups to sink or swim um, on their own. We've got uh, technical and financial support we're providing to them um, and these flood science initiatives. The most important one is we're doing uh, base level engineering uh, eventually for the whole state. So that's kind of a combination of uh, LIDAR imagery, which is a, you know, aerial photography, 3D topographic info. Uh, so LIDAR with uh, hydrology info combined with uh, hydraulic info. And you roll those up together and that's, uh, you know, what, what uh, comprises the base level engineering. And uh, as, as a non-engineer, that's about that's about the best uh, I can describe it. More, there, we have folks who can answer, you know, more specific questions about, you know, what what the base level engineering is going to entail in practice. Uh, next slide, please. All right. So this state flood plan, it's going to be kind of an inventory of the existing flood infrastructure that we have right now, and then a statewide ranked list of ongoing and proposed flood control projects. Um, so, you know, just kind of what, what the regional groups deem to be the highest priority. Um, an analysis of development in the 100-year floodplain, like I had mentioned earlier, um, the, uh, the floodplain is, is constantly evolving. The concrete jungle is extending, you know, outward from all of our metro areas. So as a result, you know, we've got to be, um, you know, constantly uh, refreshing our, our, our look at, at what the floodplain looks like. And then uh, there will also be some legislative recommendations uh, that will most likely emanate from those, those regional groups. But, you know, I'm sure as, as they roll up their sleeves and, you know, get down in the thick of it, they'll realize that there's probably some changes in the law that would benefit uh, flood planning and financing flood mitigation. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so um, that's the legislation. And then we'll kind of transition here into how um, we at the agency are uh, implementing those marching orders as laid out in the bill. Uh, next slide, please. So this is how we're implementing, implementing the flood infrastructure fund. Next slide, please. All right, so essentially every, uh, everyone is eligible. Um, the vast, vast majority of political subdivisions or folks who do uh, water planning or uh, flood planning utilities, al almost everyone is eligible. Uh, next slide, please. 
Okay, as far as what uh, projects are eligible, um, so again, essentially everything, uh, the planning and, and design phase, the uh, construction and rehab uh, phase, and then I had mentioned some of those um, non-structural uh, uh, mitigation strategies before, so that's kind of what's captured here under this other eligible um, activities deal. So, um, you know, restoration or uh, construction of wetlands, property acquisitions, also known as buyouts. Um, and uh, as far as the planning goes, I've got a couple extra notes here. Um, so we're talking preliminary engineering, project design, feasibility assessments, coordination of regional projects that are going to serve a large area. Uh, you know, money that's uh, spent toward obtaining regulatory approval, and then additional hydraulic and hydrologic uh, studies. Uh, next slide, please. So the, uh, the process, um, so uh, the entity that's seeking funding is gonna, uh, they submit an abridged application, which is a, uh, you know, a, a more brief, a shorter, not a full application. Um, those are actually due this coming Monday. Um, prioritized projects just means that, you know, our staff and folks are going to score those projects. Um, then we'll send for the highest scoring projects that are above a certain threshold, we'll send an invitation to those entities so they can submit a full application. And then um, the TWDB board, so my boss and the other two board members will uh, uh, approve of uh, certain projects to fund them at a public meeting and then they'll have six months to close um, on those funds. Um, so since uh, this is the first year, we're, on, we're working on kind of a more compressed timeline. Um, so there are you know, more defined due dates, but starting uh, next year, uh, we'll be accepting abridged applications on kind of a rolling basis throughout the year. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the uh, type of assistance available. Um, I mentioned to y'all earlier, the, the vast majority of what we do is uh, low interest loans, which are definitely a good deal. Um, but here, uh, we're, we're only offering 0% uh, loans and grants. So um, an even better deal. Um, the amount of, this is all highly nuanced and I, you know, I, I think we'll be able to share this presentation with you. I've got some resources uh, to look at uh, on the very last slide, um, but um, in general, you know, that the amount of grant an entity will be eligible for is based upon um, the socioeconomics of the area. So we're talking about like median income, uh, unemployment rate, um, several other things, um, the location of the city. Um, so uh, a rural city or one located outside of a metropolitan statistical area will be uh, eligible for uh, a little bit more. And then if you've got some of these uh, green or nature-based non-structural components, um, those will be um, eligible for may maybe an even little bit bigger uh, grant chunk. And, uh, you know, as far as 0% loans go, um, just to kind of quantify that, um, uh, it's, it's roughly equal to like a 50% grant. If you think about the interest that you're not paying over time, I imagine there's a lot of people in the audience who have a 30 year mortgage. And if you can remember, um, I just did a refinance. So, so I, I definitely remember, but uh, you know, you'll look at those truth and lending um, disclosures and you know, on that 30 year mortgage, the amount that you're paying in principle over the 30 years, is you depending upon the interest rate, obviously, is usually pretty close to the amount um, that you're going to pay in interest um, over that 30 year period. So that's just kind of another way of, of looking at the benefit of uh, a 0% loan. It, it really does add up over the course of 20 or 25 uh, or 30 years not having to, to pay interest. Um, and grants are even better, right? That's, that's a 100% that's a, that's a grant, not a 50% grant. So anyhow, uh, next slide, please. All right, so there are gonna be some uh, minimum standards that uh, these projects and the entities that are applying 
for funding need to meet. Uh, they have to include a benefit uh, cost ratio for the project. Um, and that's just so we can get uh, some, some data going. Uh, we're not going to be scoring them based upon the benefit cost ratio. Um, there was a lot of feedback we got that, you know, how, how that uh, BCR is calculated can create some issues. So uh, we, there was a vigorous debate on how to do that. So right now it's just something to include, but it's not, it is not an official scoring criteria. There's a required MOU, which basically memorializes the uh, don't flood your neighbor concept. So if an entity is going to apply, then they've got to uh, enter into an MOU with other uh, nearby communities located in the same watershed. Um, we've got a template MOU uh, on our website. So, you know, folks aren't left to figure that out on their own. Um, the affidavit goes along with the MOU. And then, uh, you know, we're not going to do any redundant funding, which I guess seems obvious, but, you know, it's important to spell out. So we're not, to that first point, uh, we're not going to re reimburse anyone for something they've already built. This is uh, incentive financing to create new mitigation projects in the future. And uh, obviously, if, if a, a entity has already secured funding for its project, we're not going to allow them uh, to double dip and get funding from us as well. Uh, next slide, please. Hey, Patrick. Uh, this yes, is Julio. Just you know, we have a few more minutes. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. All right. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna speed up a little bit here so I get through all of it. Um, so there there needs to be uh, floodplain ordinances uh, in place. And they've got to be enforcing them. Um, and, uh, you know, we're going to equip folks with data. They've got to be doing this planning and finance proposal based upon, um, mo you know, recent, current good data. Um, and for those folks that are applying for construction funds, um, they need to be able to demonstrate us that they've also budgeted and planned for maintenance and operations. You know, we don't want to provide funding to build, uh, you know, something that's going to immediately fall into disrepair. So that's just kind of how we're going to be good stewards of those funds there. Uh, next slide, please. All right, there's four uh, big categories that we're funding. This first one is kind of a large scale watershed wide flood protection planning. Uh, the second one is probably going to be the meat of the money. That's our, our uh, PADCR. Um, the third is going to be, uh, we're going to, we have a, a little, uh, we're, we're going to attempt to set aside some money for uh, federal award matching funds. Um, we want to make sure that uh, especially our, our, our poorer communities are able to unlock um, that money um, that the feds uh, are able to provide, but that requires a match. And then number four, uh, the immediately effective in protecting life and property is some of that non-structural stuff I mentioned before, uh, flood early warning, uh, low water crossings, uh, that type of stuff. Next slide, please. Um, here's the timeline. Um, so we've had this uh, application period open for about three months. It's closing on Monday. Um, over the summer, we're going to score those projects and invite the highest scoring ones. Um, the ones that get invited to submit a full, um, they'll need to, they'll have about three months to submit that full application. Um, the board will make its commitments uh, in a public meeting. Um, and then we'll start closing on funds as soon as we can. Borrowers will have, I believe, six months uh, from the date of commitment to when they actually close on the funds. Next slide, please. Uh, this is our partnership with uh, Department of Emergency Management and the General Land Office. Um, Colin did a good job describing um, some of the funding opportunities that they're providing. So we want to make sure two things, that we're not duplicating effort on the government side, and then we also want to make sure that um, folks are getting the best uh, deal they can. Um, for those who are applying. Next slide, please. So flood planning, here's how we're implementing Senate Bill 8. Um, so again, it's a brand new bottom-up regional state approach. Um, so we had 50, 60 years to get the water planning component right, and we're trying to get this done in five years. Um, there's 12 interest groups that, that constitute the voting members. Um, so that's gonna be uh, one each from uh, agriculture, industry, river authorities, 
cities, counties, water districts, flood districts, electric utilities, water utilities, environmental, environmental interests. And then each group also needs to have a member from the public and a small business rep. Next slide, please. These are the 15 uh, regions that we came up with. Um, as I said before, you know, we had to do this based upon a uh, river basin basis. Uh, flood water that doesn't, you know, doesn't care about political boundaries. So we wanted to make it, uh, you know, each river basin a single um, region. But if you look at the Rio Grande, you know, that's, it's too big. So we divided it up into two. Up north, the Red River, again, too big, had to divide it up into two. And then the Brazos, we had to divide it up into two. So upper and lower. Next slide, please. Um, if, if you're a lawyer or just a, uh, a water nerd, um, you, can, <laughs> you can consult these. This is our, our rules in the Texas Administrative Code. Uh, next slide, please. And then here's some ideas on how you can get involved in the regional flood planning process. We're uh, soliciting nominations for uh, voting members for each group. So like I said, 15 times 12, uh, that's 180 folks. Uh, we're gonna be uh, 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 designating. Um, and then the groups have the flexibility to appoint non-voting members. You can also just participate and attend the meetings. Um, next slide, please. And then uh, pretty much all the information that I covered um, can be found. Those are all live uh, links. So if, if you end up with a copy of the PowerPoint, um, you'll be able to uh, go back and review um, the information that I covered. I kind of just wanted to get you all familiar with what's going on. Um, and you know, if you have any more nuanced questions, um, you know, hopefully you can answer them in there. And that's all I got. Okay, thank you, Patrick. So at this time, I do have a question. How can uh, the attendees receive application guidelines that are due on Monday? So the, so the, and it, yeah, well, you know, the, the timing is, I guess, unfortunate. Um, I, it, it looks like we're going to be oversubscribed on, on applications. You know, we've, word of mouth, we've heard about uh, quite a few that are coming in from, well, the Houston area, obviously, um, Southeast Texas, the Valley. I mean, we're, we're going to have a good mix. Um, so the, the entities who are eligible to apply, they've, you know, they've, they've been involved in the process um, all along. And I think, um, um, you know, they'll, my, my suspicion is that they're, they're, they've been prepared all along. So no, you know, we can't, can't do anything new now, but, uh, ho hopefully that answers the question. Okay. So I know we're slightly before one. So I wanted to thank all our speakers for coming in today. I know that, uh, today's Friday, um, a lot of great information. Um, and at this time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to launch our second poll. Uh, you'll see a screen will pop up. Uh, the second poll has three questions. So I am going to allow, I'm going to launch it right now. I'm going to give everybody about a minute to, to answer the poll. The first question is, with the information presented today, will you be pursuing projects with, um, and you have the the organizations that presented today. Question number two, I, I'd like the next AEC webinar to be on uh, opportunity discussions from state agencies, AEC best practices learn, how to improve SOQ submittal. Uh, question number three, do you have a few projects in mind that may qualify for funding under the programs uh, we presented? So the other thing too, just to remind everybody, we are gonna send this um, presentation out in the next few days. And also in that email, you'll see that there will be a evaluation link. So please make sure you fill out that evaluation and provide us comments on what else uh, you wanna see from the AEC committee. So I'm gonna give everybody about 30 more seconds to answer the poll questions. And again, everybody's contact information is in the um, 
in the PowerPoint deck that we'll provide. And I, I know that some information has been put on the chat, so go ahead and check out the chat. Um, and you can do screenshots of the chat. You can get any contact information that was placed there or any questions that were answered. Okay, I'm gonna give about 10 more seconds. I'm gonna end the poll and share the results. Um, so you guys can see the results right now on the three questions. And the next thing I wanna touch base on is, um, I wanna thank everybody for coming in today. Um, if you want to do a screenshot of this, here's our website and our phone number in case you need any other information. Um, I also want to make sure I thank our committee members um, that are listed here. And, and like I mentioned before, this idea of doing this webinar was Alberto's. Um, so thank you, Alberto, and then Lewis also for helping to spearhead this. Um, and lastly, uh, before we wrap up and, and some of us get to start enjoying our weekend, uh, just wanted to update everybody a little bit about the RHCA. If this is the first time you're hearing about us, um, we've been known more for the contractors, uh, commercial contractor side. A few years ago, we started doing more on the architectural and engineering side, and we actually had our mission statement um, changed to reflect that we are covering the architectural and engineering side as well as construction. Um, so I want to thank everybody for joining us today, um, and I hope everybody has a great weekend, and if you have any questions, you guys know how to get a hold of us. Thank you, everybody, and I hope everybody has a good weekend.